Russia, nation in conflict, God's instrument to fulfill end time prophecy. World War III, will it be fought with conventional armaments or nuclear weaponry? Armageddon, Satan's last attempt to thwart the eternal plan of Almighty God. Russia, World War III, and Armageddon. Hello, I'm Dr. Jack Van Impey, and I've been in the ministry for 40 years. 37 years ago, I began preaching a sermon entitled, The Coming War with Russia, According to the Bible. Four decades later, I'm literally shocked, stunned, astonished, amazed when I pick up the daily newspapers. For they're saying exactly what I've said for these 40 years. And folks, today I'm going to bring this message to you, just like it was preached the first time 37 years ago, to show you that why I believe Jesus Christ's coming is right at the door. I'm going to be using the materials of some great and outstanding men, great scholars of the 20th century, Dr. L. Sale Harrison, Dr. DeHaan, Dr. Gableine, Dr. Schofield, Dr. Marmion Lau, Dr. Charles Pont, Dr. Louis Talbot, Dr. Edmund, Dr. Lockyer, Dr. Bauman, Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. John Walford, Dr. Wilbur Smith, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, the ancient historian Flavius Josephus, and then, of course, Gibbons, who penned the fall and decline of the Roman Empire. Now, don't let all that frighten you. I'm going to try to boil it down into the simplest of terms so that when this message is finished, you'll know exactly what God's Word has to say about the future. They say there are three ways that one can prove the Bible. One, through archaeological diggings. I'm amazed every time I go to the Holy Land. Why? Because the Jewish people have uncovered artifacts through archaeological digging. And then they've put up the Bible verse where it tells what would happen and the date it did happen, proving hundreds of times that this precious book, the Holy Word of God, as it predicted these things, is the inerrant Word of God. There are no mistakes in this precious book. Of course, the second way to prove the Bible is through prophecy, and archaeology and prophetical searchings go together. But there's a third way. And one doesn't have to be much of a scholar to use the third method. I heard about a skeptic who said to a Christian, ah, I don't believe that Bible has just a lot of mythological hot air. He said, if you could prove one verse in the Bible to be true, I'd believe it. But you can't. <laughs> this little Christian who only knew John 3, 16 and one other verse said, do you mean if I could just prove one verse in this book to be true, you'd believe it? Yeah, but you can't. This little Christian walked up to the skeptic who had a nose like a tomato. He took hold of it, turned it around, let it bounce back, and it started to bleed. And he said, you crazy religious fanatic, why'd you do that? The little Christian said, well, sir, you said if I could prove one verse, you'd believe all of it. Proverbs 30, 33, the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. <laughs> I've always enjoyed that. How true it is. We're going to start it with some of the prophecies. They'll not be far-fetched or stretched out of proportions. It'll be the word of God, as you'll see. Now, I will be using Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 so repetitiously throughout the sermon that when I say 38 or 39, you'll know I'm referring to the book of Ezekiel. Let me also say that there are always skeptics who say, ah, oh, these preachers, these prophetical men try to find something in the Bible to fit the headlines of the day. Not so. If one has a Schofield edition of the Bible, and reads the footnotes on Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, Dr. Schofield said, this is Russia, Moscow and Tobolsk. But when did he say it? One then turns to the front of the Schofield Bible and reads the following, all notes copyrighted, 1909. What? 80 years ago? That's right. 
the great Anglican Bishop of London, England, Bishop Lowthy, 220 years ago preached the coming war with Russia, according to the Bible, similarly to what I'm going to say today. Now, let's get into the meat of the subject. First of all, let's begin with the identification of the nations. Chapter 38, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. You say, who are these names? Where did they originate? Well, the first one is Gog, G-O-G, and -G, means nothing more or less than end time ruler. The other names begin to tell the story. Magog, Meshech, Tubal, Rash. Where did they originate? Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. The sons of Japheth are Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. These are grandsons of Noah through the Gentile Javan. After the flood, they settled in Asia Minor. Where'd they go from there? First of all, Magog. He left Asia Minor and went to the land we now call Russia, settling where the Caucasus Mountains was his southern boundary. The ancient historian Josephus, book 1, chapter 6, says that the Scythians who settled there were called by the Greeks Magog or Magogites. Next we see Meshach. He left Asia Minor and went to the western part of the land we now call Russia, settling in what is presently called Moscow. If one were to take this term Meshach, he'd find that that was the first name used to identify this place called Moscow. It was Meshach, later changed to Mosach, then to Moscati, then to Moscovy, hence we have Moscovites, and finally, as you and I know it, Moscow. That's why Schofield in 1909 in the footnotes said Moscow for Meshach. Next, Tubal. He left Asia Minor and went to the eastern part of the land we call Russia, settling in the Siberian area. Oh, this is interesting. Get a world map. Run your finger over to Siberia. Then southwest of Siberia is Tobolsk. Well, you say in the Bible it's Tobol. On the map it's Tobolsk. Why? Because the Russian suffix SK has been added to the ending of the word. And it may interest you to know that when the Bolsheviks marched into Russia, they took Tsar Nicholas and his family and assassinated, murdered them in Tubal, right there in your Bible, Ezekiel 38 too. Gary Powers, of course, is now deceased through a plane crash in Los Angeles. But do you remember when the U-2 pilot was shot down in Russia many years ago? His name was Gary Powers. You know where he was shot down? Right there, Tubal, Tobolsk. What a book. That text was penned 2,500 years ago. Think of it, 25 centuries in the past. You and I have lived to see these momentous things happening. But there's a special name here. And in our English version, it says Chief Prince. If I had the Hebrew Bible, for the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, I would have the word R-O-S-H, Rash. Boy, that's important. Well, why does it say chief prince in the English version? Because they put the meaning of the name rather than the name. For instance, a man can be named Bill, but a bill is also something one pays. My name is Jack. A Jack also holds up a car while changing a tire. What they did was put the meaning of the name Rash, the head of state, a chief, rather than the name Rash. But Rosh was the tribe dwelling in the area of the Volga, according to the great scholar Jesenius. Now, the Greek is Rusia, R-U-C-I-A, eventually changed to the R-U-S-S-I-A, Russia of the present hour. I like this. Dr. Wilbur Smith, that great prophetical scholar who was an instructor at Fuller and Trinity Seminaries, delved into this subject, and he got the materials from the Soviet Union on how the Russians got their modern name Russia. Whew, this is unbelievable. It's the 11th century. 
and the northern barbarian hordes are attacking Constantinople. Phocius the emperor says, who are these northern barbarians? They seem to have no name. And he came across Ezekiel 38.2, in the Hebrew Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that for the next 800 years, people from that time until the 19th century called these folks Rash or Russians, as we now call them Russians? But there's more. They come from the north. Now, if you're to get a map and put your finger on Israel and go directly north, you'll run your finger up to the USSR because Russia is north of Israel. Over and over, this book says that when this battle takes place, they're going to come from the north against Israel. For instance, Ezekiel 38, 15, Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Chapter 39, verse 2, I'll turn you back. Leave but the sixth part of thee will cause you to come up from the north parts. The king of the north invades. Daniel 11, 13. Daniel 11, 44 is tidings out of the east. There we have the Orient, China and her hordes. And the north shall trouble him. Who's him? This Antichrist, this world dictator who will be sitting in a temple in Jerusalem, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. So we see him coming from the north against him. But this is amazing. Dr. M. R. D. Hahn, Richard, as many of you have seen him on television, was his son. But his father said, and this is 60 years ago, I challenge anyone to debate me on Joel 2, verse 20. There is no doubt about it, this is Russia. Why? Because the geographical circumstances demand this to be so. In chapter 2, verse 20, talking about this hour in history when they're going to come from the north against Israel, says, I remove far off from you, Israel, the northern army, and drive him into the desolate area with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, the only place north of Israel with a barren area, Siberian, two oceans surrounding it, is the USSR. We're living in tremendous times as we see these things all coming to pass. Now, who is going to unite with the Soviet Union? This is in the Bible? Yes. Chapter 38, verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with him, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the North Quarter and his bands, and many people with him. Persia. Remember the old Persian Empire? They changed their name to Iran. 1932. Bible prophecy was beginning to be fulfilled. Next we see Ethiopia. I remember when I first began preaching this message 37 years ago, people said, come on, Van Impey, Ethiopia? Why, hail Selassie, the lion of the tribe of Judah, one of the great Christian leaders of our time, rules the nation. It could never become communist. You know what's happened. One of the reasons when these people were starving to death just a few years ago that the food couldn't get through was because of communist control, not allowing the food to get through. They became communistic. Next, we see Libya, Gaddafi. Then we see Gomer and all his bands. Now, Gibbons, in his writings, The Fall and Decline of the Roman Empire, volume 1, page 204, says, Gomer is modern Germany. The oldest maps of the world where Germany is now located had on them Gomer, Gomerlunt, Gomeria, and Ashkenaz, his son. In fact, many of the Jews who came out of Germany to the camps at Auschwitz and other places were called the Ashkenazis because of the Germanic influence in their lives. And I've been astounded the last few months as to what's been happening in Germany. And I do believe, and I've said it for 37 years, that there will be a unification because it says Gomer and all his bands uniting with the nation called Russia as they come from the north against Israel. The next term is Tagarma of the north. Dr. Raymond Edmond, who for years was the president of Wheaton College, said, I spent hundreds of hours in research on one term in the Bible, Tagarma, and have concluded that it is Turkey 
And Turkey, of course, is north of Israel. But there's more. Tagarma fathered Haik, H-A-I-K, who settled Syria. And right in our day and age, we find that Syria is even preparing for an attack in the future on Israel. But they'll all be united under the label, the Great Northern Bear. Of course, we find in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 44, Egypt will be involved with the Arab unity block. But verse 44, tidings out of the east, China, and out of the north, Russia, shall trouble him, this Antichrist who sits in that temple in Jerusalem. And we'll show you the other side in just a few moments. Now, who's going to oppose them? Ezekiel 38, 13, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarsus. Sheba and Dedan, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, are in the Arabian Peninsula. They are oil-rich lands, such as Saudi Arabia. They will probably want to remain with the Western democracies because of the wealth, the income they're getting from their oil. And then we see Tarsus. Every time Tarshish is found in the Bible, it is always the land farthest west of Israel or Britain. Notice it says merchants of Tarshish. This nation had to get its goods around the world. And the only way to do it when the Bible was written and in the centuries to come was through ships. I think all of you remember the slogans of history, Britannia rules the waves, England the mistress of the seas. The merchants got all of their tin from Tarshish. Britannia means the land of tin. But this is interesting. It says Tarshish with all of her young lions. Now there's some who say, well, we think it's Spain because there was a Tar Teresa. But that was an outpost for Britain. We believe that England and the symbol on the American flag is the eagle, but the symbol on the English flag is the mother lion, is Tarshish. Tarshish with all of her young lions. And that, of course, speaks about all of her colonization. That includes America because we came forth from England. That includes much of the Western Bloc of nations now under common market. And we're going to see this side taking the opposite position against the Soviet Union when they come from the north against Israel. Oh, this is interesting. And I'm going to go slowly on this because it is so deep and yet so powerful and so potent, so moving, so dynamic that when we get through with this, you're going to know how near all of these events are and how near the coming of Jesus Christ is for his church, his blood-bought children. Now, this is really interesting. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 to 41, a story is recorded about Nebuchadnezzar the king. He had a dream and couldn't remember what the dream was. So he called in all of his magicians and soothsayers saying, I had a dream and I can't remember it. If you cannot tell me what my dream was, I'll kill you. <laughs> How would you like to have been a prophet in that time? Well, they couldn't answer it. And he killed them. But there was a prophet by the name of Daniel, whose God was Jehovah. And the Bible says that Daniel prayed three times a day, for he was a man of God. And he said to Nebuchadnezzar, Give me some time to talk to my God, and I'll tell you what your dream was. He went to prayer. God revealed it to him, but you know what? He revealed to him the plan of history right to the end. So Daniel came to the king and said, here's your dream. You saw this great image. It had a head of gold. Hey, that's it. Right on, man. It had a chest and arms of silver. Right again. It had a stomach and thighs of brass. I can't believe this. You're a genius. No, no, it's not me. It's my God who revealed it to me. It had two legs of iron. Yeah. And ten toes. Boy. This is hard to believe, Daniel. Then Daniel, in a very frustrated 
state of mindset, but I can't bring you good news, and I'm afraid to tell you the truth. Go ahead, Daniel. I won't take your life. Be honest with me. Did God give you the interpretation of the dream? Yes. Yes. That's not good. Why? That head of gold is you, Nebuchadnezzar. Head of the Babylonian Empire. But soon you're going to be crushed by the chest and arms of silver, the Medes and the Persians. It happened. Prophecies right on schedule. Then he said, the stomach and thighs of brass represents Alexander the Great of Greece, and he'll smash the kingdom of the media Persians. It happened. Then there'll be two legs of iron smashing Alexander the Great's empire, Greece. Why two legs? Because at one time, the Roman Empire had two headquarters, one at Rome and one in Constantinople. Now, you notice that some powers always smash the preceding power, but not so with Rome. It was never defeated. Rome fell through internal corruption. Gibbons talks all about it in his writings, the fall and decline of the Roman Empire. We see no breaks in the legs, meaning that Rome will come back at the end time. For this whole prophecy, Daniel 11.30, is for the end time in a deteriorated form. It will still be iron mixed with clay as the ten toes, ten, wiggle their way back into life. This coincides with the beast of Revelation 13.1. And I long to share this with you right now. Because this is the beast in that 13th chapter that gives that infamous number, 666 the right hand or forehead. And verse 1 says, I saw the beast rise up out of the sea, the sea of nations, having seven heads and ten horns. Now Daniel speaks about the ten toes in chapter 2 and the ten horns in chapter 7. 2 Peter 1.21 says that the Bible interprets the Bible. Folks say, oh, nobody can understand that business about ten horns. I can. Why? Because the scripture tells me the meaning of the ten horns. Hundreds of years before John was going to mention it in Revelation 13, 1, God already gave Daniel the interpretation. Now let's put it together. Daniel 7, 24. The ten, keep that figure in your mind, the ten horns are ten kings that shall arise, not who are in existence, but shall arise, future tense, when? Daniel 11.30, the end time. Wow, I got so excited when I saw this just about a month ago. In the year 57 B.C., 57 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, the Roman Empire annexed Belgium, Holland and Luxembourg. All right? 2,000 years pass. Now the toes are beginning to revive our era. And a grouping of nations comes into existence led by Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. The same ones. The beginning of the revival of the old Roman Empire. The toes are beginning to move. That was 1948. Then, in 1957, three other nations joined. Remember, we're counting to ten now. And at that point in time, West Germany, France, and Italy became members of what we now call common market. So we have six. Then, 1973, another three joined. England, Ireland, and Denmark. Whew, nine. We're aiming for 10. 1981 in January, Greece became number 10, and Bible students and Christians said, this is it. This is it. It wasn't. A few more calculations. Watch Daniel 7.24 again. The 10 horns are 10 kings that shall arise. 1981 completed that. 
but the rest of the prophecy could not happen until there were ten. The rest, and there shall arise another eleventh. And he would subdue three, literally excommunicate, or boot out three. In Daniel 7, 8, we read the same thing. The prophet says, I consider the horns. How many, Daniel? Ten. And there came up among the ten another little horn, eleven, before whose face, number eleven, three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now, logical deduction tells us that if three are going to be booted out, you have to have thirteen with three booted out to end up with ten, because we must end up with ten, as we'll see. In the last two years, hmm, Spain and Portugal became number eleven and twelve. And now Austria has applied to become number 13. The Bible says when there are 10, others would join. In fact, we could end up with 16 or 17. But when the final comes, then, folks, there must be 13. And one takes charge out of the final three, eliminates three of the originals, which could be Denmark and Ireland. And I said in my magazine recently, Greece, but I have other thoughts because I said I'm not sure about Greece since, remember that term earlier in the message? Gomer, Gomerland, Gomeria, Ashkenaz, Ezekiel 38.5. And all his bands joins with Russia to invade Israel. If they join with Russia to invade Israel, they can't be part of that Western community at that time. So this could be the third. So we would have Ireland, Denmark, they weren't part of the original Roman Empire, and Germany voluntarily pulling out. Some have not wanted to go in anyway. Now there could be more, as I said, because Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Albania were all part of the old Roman Empire. So there could be maybe 16, 17, but when it all comes to the final head, and I believe soon, some could drop out, and we'd end up with these 13 and then one of those final three out of Portugal, Spain, or Austria could say, I'm going to eliminate three more. And we have our final 10. What's so important about that? Remember that prayer we've prayed for so long in our churches, Matthew 6:10. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Matthew 6:10. He's going to come. He comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Revelation 19, 16. But when? When? Oh, oh. Daniel 2, 44. This is the chapter where he talked about the ten toes. In chapter 7, he talked about the ten horns. Now he says, here is when the king comes to set up his kingdom. In the days of these ten, the final ten, after there have been 13, reduced to 13 at least, or just 13 as a completed fact. And then one arises out of the final three, eliminates three, and we're down to the last ten. In the days of these ten shall the Lord God of heaven set up his kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Folks, we're in the last moments of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. It's all here and in our generation. And here are the two opposing groups, Russia and her hordes, the Western democracies, along with Sheba, Dedan, and of course, Tarshish is already covered even within the Ten Toes. So we see these two mighty powers marching against one another, battling. Not the battle of Armageddon, but the battle that leads to Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. Now, where is it going to take place? Israel. Folks, this is one of the most important parts of the message you're going to hear. For 2,500 years, imagine 25 centuries, there was no place on earth called Israel. They had been dispersed. It was called the Diaspora. God says, I'm going to bring you back from the nations. Ezekiel 36, 24. I'll take you from among the Gentiles, gather you out of all nations, and bring you into your own lands. The 
bones would come to life. Remember that spiritual? The bones, them bones, them dry bones. <laughs> Who are they? Ezekiel 37, 11. These bones are the whole house of Israel. They would come out of their graves. The Gentile nations of the world come back to their land. They've come from 120 nations now speaking 83 languages. 50,000 are about to come from the Soviet Union because of this new glustus perestroika policy. It's all coming to pass in your time, in our generation. Could Russia invade Israel in 1745? 1826, 1947? No, there was no Israel. But in 1948, the Jewish people pulled up their flag, the six-pointed star of David, and said, we call ourselves Israel. And that's important because in 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, where they come from the north against Israel, 17 times the battlefield of the world is Israel, and there could be no invasion of Israel for 2,500 years until your era time, since 1948 onward. Let me prove that. Chapter 38, verse 8, against the mountains of Israel. Verse 16, thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. Verse 19, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. 39 2, I'll turn you back, leave, but the sixth part of thee will cause you to come up from the north parts and bring you upon the mountains of Israel. 39 4, thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel. 39 12, seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them. Israel, Israel. It's for now, folks. It's our generation. It's happening. Now, do you see why I'm so excited? Not because of this war, but because it indicates that the return of Jesus Christ is so near. Now, why? Why is the Russian bear going to move against Israel? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, there's a thousand mile oil line from Abqai to Haifa. Secondly, the Dead Sea and its minerals is worth two trillion dollars not million not billion but two trillion what wealth however I believe the main reason is that it'll be the greatest anti-semitic push in history Satan has always hated the Jewish people why because they gave us every book of the Bible with the exception of the book of Luke and Acts written by a Greek the Virgin Mary was Jewish. And God looked down and said, I'm going to send my son into the world. What race shall I choose? I'm a Belgian. He didn't choose my race. <laughs> I'm disappointed. He said, I'm going to choose an Israelite. And the precious Virgin Mary was used of God to bring the Savior into the world. God in human flesh. That's why... Romans 9, 5 says, Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, 16. Well, these verses talk about the deity of Christ, that it was God who came. And so Satan has always hated Israel. And when Adolf Hitler came to power, the maniac of history, and did away with six million Jewish people, Satan was behind it. And he moved them into gas ovens, tortured them barbarously. My uncle, Franz van Impe in Belgium, for many Europeans went to the camps with the Jews, was beheaded by the Nazis. And so I have a real compassionate spirit there for these people. However, this will be Satan's last attempt to obliterate the Jews. They're going to be hated of all nations. And Ezekiel 38, 16 says, Thou shalt come up against my people, Israel. You say, why do you call Israel God's people? Because 17 times the text says Israel, Israel. And now he says, they are my people. And the world and Russia leading them will come up against the Jews. Read Revelation 12 when you have ample time. Anti-Semitism. It's rearing its ugly head again. Skinheads and all the rest. Ku Klux Klaners. 
Gomer, Gomerland, Gomeria, Ashkenaz, as we said earlier, will undoubtedly want to go along because it's another anti-Semitic purge. Nazism is rising again. But it's in every nation. Because every nation is going to hate the Jew, except the few I mentioned earlier, who will side with her. It's going to be a tremendous, horrendous time in history. Something like we have never known in the past, nor will we ever know anything like it again in the future. But they come against Israel. Why? To take a spoil and to take a prey. Captives, to torture them, slaughter them. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And Jacob is Israel. All you have to do is look at Romans 11, chapter, verses 26 and onward to find out that Jacob is Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's another reason I don't believe the born-again believers, we Christians, will be here for what I'm about to say. Because now we're going to get into the future. This involves you and me. However, I believe that we're going up first. I believe the rapture takes place before this horrendous conflagration on earth occurs. So let's first of all consider that the largest armies in the history of the world are going to converge in the Middle East. Chapter 38, verse 16, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land, swarms of troops. Revelation 9.16 says the number of the army was 200,000, 1,000, 200 million. We had 40 million in uniform during World War I from all nations. 88 million in uniform from all nations in the second horrendous war. Now we are talking about 200 million. Two and a half times that of past wars, of the second war. Many Bible scholars say that's just the beginning because Revelation 9, 16, picturing an army of 200 million is just the Orient as they come out of the East for tidings out of the East and out of the North. China and Russia shall trouble him. The Antichrist who's sitting in that temple in Jerusalem, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, as mentioned earlier, and the sermon. What armies? We're talking now about disarmament. That all has to happen for what I'm about to describe, as we'll see at the conclusion of the message. Secondly, the deadliest weapons in history are going to be used. Oh, folks, listen to 2 Peter 3.10. How up to date? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned. Can you imagine the Apostle Peter 1900 years ago predicting something like this and using the very terminology that scientists in our day would use concerning an A and H bomb? First of all, he says the heavens pass away with the noise there. That's the blast of an atomic weapon and the mushrooming clouds. Secondly, says, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Whew. If you were to go to the library tomorrow and say to the librarian, I want to study the A or H bomb, she'd take you to the letter E to the word elements for our modern day scientists have classified these bombs under the term elements. 19 centuries ago, the Holy Spirit said, Peter, write it. Elements. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's God. And known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world to the end. Acts 15, 18. Thirdly, the earth and the works that are there and shall be burned. At El Magardo, New Mexico, when we were testing A-bombs, the desert became a sea of glass from the burning effects. Deadly weapons? Some folks say, well, but 2 Peter 3.10 is the end of the world. This is God administering this judgment. It has nothing to do with ARH bombs. Well, all right. Let's say you were correct. Let's forget that text. But when we come to the word elements, we can tie it in with A and H bombs. But let's use other texts. When God put that rainbow in the sky, that was a promise to Noah that the world would not end with the judgment of a flood. 
another flood after that one that Noah experienced. But the final judgment on earth would be one of fire. Listen to these texts. A fire goeth before him, Psalm 97.3. The Lord will come with fire, Isaiah 66.15. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, Ezekiel 20.47. Now watch this one. Joel 2 verse 3. A fire devours before them. Who? Verse 20. Remember Dr. M. R. D. Hahn? who, using this text, said this is the Soviet Union driven back to Siberia with the two oceans surrounding that area in verse 20. And so a fire devours before them, but they're pushed back. And in verse 31, the prophet says, I saw wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, the mushrooming clouds of an atomic blast. Zephaniah 118, the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Malachi 4.1, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Folks, what I'm about to tell you is literally the most shocking thing I've said to this point of the message. In Revelation 8.7, it says, a third part of the trees was burned. Revelation 9.18, by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, smoke, and brimstone. Watch it. In chapter 8, verse 7, a third part of the earth is burned. In Revelation 9, 18, one third of the population. I took the Life Pictorial Atlas, one of the latest geographical books that gives us the land area of every nation on earth as far as square mileage is concerned, as well as the latest population figures. I took all the nations that I've outlined in this message, the ones that are going to join with Russia under Gog, Magog, Rash, and then the ones who are joining with Rash, uh, Iran, and Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Gomerlund, Tagarma, Turkey, his son Hike, Syria, the hordes out of the Orient, Daniel 11:44, those who oppose the Soviet Union, Tarshish, and all our young lions, the English-speaking nations of the world, plus the Western Confederacy, the ten final nations of common market. And I looked it all up, and with a calculator, figured it all out. And these nations, for and against, posing one another, total one-third of the Earth's land service to the exact mile. Oh, that's never happened in history. Then I again refigured it for population figures. And it came out to one-third of the Earth's population. Folks, we're living in the last days. This is the beginning of the end. We see then the largest armies converging, the deadliest weapons being used. And folks, it's going to be the bloodiest battle in history. The prophet Jeremiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, for no man wrote these things. It was always the Spirit of God telling him what to write. Said in chapter 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none, none, none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, this is why I believe we Christians are going to be gone, because Jacob is Israel. Romans eleven twenty six 26 to 28. It's Jacob's trouble. Anti-Semitism. The final purge. God's going to protect his ancient people. We'll see that in a moment. Daniel, another great Jewish prophet, said in chapter 12, verse 1, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Never, never. Daniel says there will never have been anything like this in the past, nor will there ever be anything like it again in the future. This is the ultimate. As far as a bloodbath is concerned of the nations. And so for Jerusalem, Think of it. I will make you a burdensome stone. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Joel, remember that northern army that's driven back to Siberia? Mentioned it twice or more in this message. Watch what happens when they move down. Verse 1, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. 
For the day of the Lord cometh its night hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of thick clouds and darkness. And as this northern army, Russia, marches to Israel, verse 10 says, the whole earth quakes before them. Then they're driven back, and the prophet sees fire and pillars of smoke. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, For then shall be great tribulation such as never was since the beginning of this world to this time known or ever shall be. One half of the earth's population will be annihilated. Wiped out. Obliterated. Through this war. And I, I never could quite understand where they got those figures, but I, I put it all together the other day through Revelation 9.18 and through Revelation 6. And folks, it comes to exactly one out of every two. You know, we always use that text in Matthew 24. Two shall be in a bed, one shall be taken, one shall be left. Two women shall be grinding at a mill, one shall be taken, one shall be left. We think that means the rapture when the Lord comes for the church. It doesn't. Because that would mean that 50% of the population of earth believes in Jesus Christ and is born again and ready to go. No, no. Only 2% is ready to go. One out of every 50. Not one out of every two. If you'll study Matthew 24 again, it's talking about the tribulation hour, and it's talking about the judgments that are going to fall, and one shall be taken in death, and one shall be left alive to go into the millennium. Two women shall be grinding in the mill. One shall be taken in death. The other shall be left alive to go into the millennium. That's what it teaches. 50% of the earth and its inhabitants decimated, destroyed. The bloodiest battle in the history of the world. And then the greatest defeat militarily in history as God Almighty wipes out the Soviet armies, or better term, the Russian armies, with all their allies. That's chapter 39, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to quote it like I interpreted it in the early part of the sermon because they are the same names. Behold, I'm against the old God, the Rosh, Russian, Russian prince of Moscow and Tobolsk, and I'll turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. Five-sixths of the armies are going to fall. One-sixth will be driven back to Siberia. Remember? Here's the text again. Joel 2.20 I will remove far off from you the northern army. We will drive him into a land barren and desolate Siberia with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. Chapter 39, verse 12 says, Seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of him. It's going to take every available Israelite, every available Jew, working around the clock for seven months, day and night, no rest, just to bury the bodies, the deceased, the corpus delicti of the fallen. Never been a battle like this. And it's coming and coming soon. Let me begin to wind up this message. When is it going to happen? Chapter 38, verses 8 and 16, in the latter years and in the latter days. You see, there are those who say, oh, this happened 2,500 years ago. It, wait a minute. God says, everything I've said to you in this tape is for the latter years and latter days. Latter years, latter days. And Daniel eleven thirty, the end time. This is not just happenstance. This is not just one of those things. Every small detail, every iota of the Word of God is now being fulfilled. It's here. Let's recapitulate. As we close. What's going to happen in the latter years and latter days? There's going to be a powerful nation called Rash, Russia, Russia. Through the tribal names, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, we now have Moscow and Tobolsk. Dr. Schofield said it in 1909. Dr. Gabeline said it in 1890. The great Anglican Bishop Laudi said it 220 years ago. It's here. 
All these nations will align themselves. It's here. And now with the reunification of Germany, the verge of happening in the next year, two years, five years, we see all the pieces coming to pass. Now we see common market. We see the flags flying. And there are 12 and there's going to be 13 soon when Austria is ratified. And then one arises. I think personally there will be 13. One will arise and throw out three, and you'll be down to your ten. And in the days of these ten shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. But there could be more, and they could pull out on their own, while three would be booted out. We are not dogmatic. All we know is God says there are going to be thirteen at some point in history. Three will be eliminated, and that will bring us to our final ten, and it's when we have the final ten that Christ returns. But Christ only returns after that battle has been fought. So here we have the alignment of the nations. We have everything scripturally to tell us that this is the hour. It could happen at any moment. The point is, are you ready for the great evacuation? The coming of the Lord? I personally believe that this battle takes place in the middle of the seven-year period of tribulation. I personally believe that some world leader is going to come to power on a peace platform just when it looks like all these things are about to happen and the convulsions of war are going to let loose on this planet. Someone will rise and say, peace, peace. And he's going to come out of that 13 nation confederacy that will be reduced to 10. He makes a peace pact, a peace covenant with Israel and other nations in Daniel 9.27. It confirms the covenant with many for one week. The Hebrew word there is heptad for seven years. Heptad means seven years. And in the midst of the seven years, halfway through it, three and a half years into it, he causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He breaks his covenants. He breaks his promises. He breaks his treaties. And then Russia marches. You say, why do you believe that in this text? Because of 38.11. God says, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against them that are at rest. A walled village in Bible times meant a tremendous defensive system. They put up their walls to defend themselves against the invaders. Here, there are no walls. Unwalled villages. Why? They've laid aside their armaments. He says, I will go to them that dwell safely. Israel's been there since 48, but war after war has transpired, and they're sitting there with their tanks, jets, and atomic weapons waiting. There's been no peace for Israel. But this is a time when there's peace. Because this world reader has come to power and said, peace, peace. And the world says, this is it. Utopia. Ha! We've got what we want. But this is the infamous Antichrist. And 42 months later, the covenants are broken. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 And I said all that to say this, to comfort your heart in the midst of a message like this. Since it happens in the middle of the seven years, and I am a pre-tribulationist, the seven-year period of time is called the tribulation hour. Pre means... I will meet Jesus before the tribulation or the seven-year period begins. A post-tribulationist believes he's going through it and meeting Christ at the end. We can have differences of opinion and still love one another. But I believe we're going before it happens. Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from. Not through preservation, but from. The Greek word is ek, ek, out of the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God hath not appointed us to wrath. The wrath there is not the wrath of eternal judgment, hell, but the wrath of the tribulation hour. He said, I've not appointed you, my people, my church, my blood-bought children to this time. Well, how could we escape it? The rapture. Rapture. And that is the Latin word rapio or peri which means a snatching away. Let me give you two texts yet. The event is described in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 
If you're saved, if you're washed in Christ's blood, if your sins have been forgiven, if you're repented of your sin, change your mind about the way you used to live, and you've given your heart to Christ, you've been washed in the blood, you're ready for the rapio, the repari, the rapture, the snatching away. That's all it means, snatching away. Here's what happens. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's called rapio, as I said a moment ago, because it's a snatching away. Now, the term isn't found in the Bible, but the theological truth is. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, be dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. The twinkling of an eye is the snatching away. In fact, General Electric has measured the twinkling of a human being's eye and it amounts to 11 one hundredths of a second. And we're going to hear the words, Come up hither, Revelation 4 1. And we're gone in 11 one hundredths of a second to meet the Lord. But it's only if He's here in your heart. You see, if I'm going to listen to a radio program, a favorite, and it's on 850, as far as the numbers are concerned, and I'm turned to 1040, I won't hear it. If I'm going to turn on one of my favorite television programs, and it's on Channel 2, and I'm turned to Channel 9, I'm not going to hear it. You have to be tuned in to the numbers, to the channels. And that's what it means when Jesus is in the heart. Unless he is there, you are not going to hear the voice. You're not tuned in when he says, Come up hither. And the body of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, the members of the body go home. You say, Well, how can I be tuned in? By having him in your heart. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15 3. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The death burial and resurrection of Christ is the good news, the gospel. There's a little more. When he died, he shed his blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission of sins, Hebrews 9.22. And when that precious, efficacious blood of Jesus was shed at Calvary almost 20 centuries ago, it was for you. 1 John 1.7 says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. I don't care what you've done, how often you've done it, how hideous, heinous, degraded, depraved, that sin may seem in your own eyes. If you'll come to the cross and say, this blood was shed for me, Lord Jesus, I receive you. Wash me. I repent of my sin. And that's from the Greek word metanoia. I change my mind about my sin. I change my mind about my drugs, about my alcoholism, about my sexual vices. I change my mind about lying and cheating and bribery and gambling. I change my mind about what I've been doing. And I want you, Jesus, wash me. You'll be ready for the rapio when we go home. Would you get ready? Right there in your home wherever you're watching this tape, I want you to pray this prayer. Get ready. Lord Jesus, say it after me. I'm a sinner. All have sinned. You died and rose again for me. At Calvary, you shed your blood for my sins. I want to be ready when you come. It's so near. I change my mind, repenting by changing my mind, of the way I've lived, the things I've done. Lord Jesus, I receive you now as my Savior. Come into my heart. In your name I pray. Amen. If you've made that decision, 
I have a wonderful booklet. I have it right here with me. First Steps in a New Direction. It's free. This will tell you what God wants in your life now that you've received Jesus. Your daily walk. How to grow. That which is needed daily in your life to grow. It's yours. Freely. Given without cost or obligation. Because I love you. And if you've just made that decision, you're my brother or sister in Jesus. And when the sound rings throughout the heavenlies, come up hither. We'll be together. Let me know that you become my brother or sister in Christ today. Write me. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Then I'll begin praying for you when you write. Because I love you. We're now members of the family of God together. Watch for these future videos from Jack Vanapi Ministries, Revelation Revealed, The Beginning of the End, America in Prophecy, The Decline and Fall of the American Empire. Our address is Jack Vanapi Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan 48007.